Now, when I came to Japan a few times on trips, I liked what I saw here. What I saw was a country that was prospering, it was doing well, it was safe, it was clean, it was beautiful. I wanted part of it. Gene, I want to thank you for allowing me to come to your home to do this podcast. I've known you for a really long time. Yeah, it's been quite a while. It has been a long time. And, and we've had a good relationship. You taught my kids. That's right, we I did. We worked together, and worked, everything was pretty good. You, to, you told me something that was very interesting. You said I was the first human Spider-Man in Japan? First Japanese on Japan, the first live action guy who put on Spider-Man outfit. And you have a picture of that, don't you? Some place somewhere, we yeah, have yeah. pictures. Somewhere, somewhere in the archives. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I'll have to wow, find it. I don't thank have you right so now. much. Listen, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous, but not now, because we've been talking for a while, mm -hmm. but I was a little nervous before I came here because I couldn't wait to see you and to talk with you. And you've had a very interesting career here in Japan, let alone in your life. Mm -hmm. You've had a very interesting career. Because when I met you, I think you mentioned that Bob Beveridge introduced us to each other. Yes. And I think that's because, I forget what it was, you wanted a referee or something? You said we for wanted a judge, judge for a, judge for a, a, judge. a mix okay. match. Okay. But when I first met you, you used to always walk with a limp. And I thought yes. that was because you were born that way, but that's not the case. No. How did it happen? Well, I had a car accident that was very bad when I was back in high school. Mm -hmm. I had one of the first cars that had power brakes and power steering. And I lost them both at the same time. And I drove into a tree. You lose when you hit a tree with a car. They don't break. A concrete pole will snap, but a tree stands there. And the whole engine came back on me. It shattered my leg, my pelvis, my back. I had a concussion. I was in a hospital for three months, at least. I was in bed for probably a year. I had. So I had to, after that, put my leg back together. And this was, we're talking now back in the 60s in America. I had such a bad accident that they couldn't operate on me because my head was very injured and I was in a uh, coma for months. So during that time, what they did was put my leg in traction and take a piece of the bone that had actually come out on the road from my car accident, put it back in, but they never could get it back in right. So my leg was short. That's the reason. So and therefore the, reason. the shortness, I made up for that by getting a built up shoe. Right. Right. Well, well there's one thing for way. sure, it did not limit your mobility because I saw you everywhere. Yeah, I used to get <laughs> you were around. constantly moving around all the time. All the, tell me, where were you born, Gene? New I know York. this in the documentary. New York, New York City. Right. To Polish family. Polish family. Immigrants, they came right? over for after World War I as refugees. Right. And they were hard workers, middle class. Well, actually, when they first came in, they were probably the, uh, the bottom low class. middle. They were right. bottom of the barrel. First, right. first like first responders. They mm -hmm. came over with the boat. Right. And uh, they were living in a place called Palisades Park, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I was born in Queens in a hospital. And my father would, took jobs, so did my mother. Everybody worked in the family. And they decided to open up their own business. So they bought a restaurant in upstate New York, a place called Roscoe, which almost no, nobody's ever heard of. So they moved the family up there and we started a restaurant called the Red Rose. And everybody in the family worked there. My grandparents, my grandmother, my grandfather, my father, my mother, my sister, and myself started working from a young age in the family. It still exists. And that... It still exists? It's still out there. You can go there and spend the night there if you want. Yes, wow. it's, it's now, we sold it to somebody who's turned the place around and they did well. And I and learned... They, they left the name the same too? They kept the name Red Rose. Rebuilt the place. Yeah, they're I on would. a nice site and everything. Beautiful. So I, from that point, learned the value of hard work. This was in the morning when you woke up, before you went to school, you had to help fix the place up. You had to clean up from the night before. I helped my mother prepare salads and things like that for lunch. Then I'd go to school, come back after school. No time for any extracurriculars because I had to come home and work on tables. I was a busboy at first. And gradually I worked my way through the entire restaurant business as a bartender and waiter. Mm -hmm. And you learned a lot about people from being a bartender. I learned more about people from being a bartender than going to college. That's for sure. Do you have siblings? I have a sister who just passed away. Okay, sorry to hear that. She's, was she older than you or younger? She was older than me. How many years difference? 
probably about 10 years. 10 years. So we, you guys weren't close or were you close? We were close because we close. had to work in the same restaurant. Right. But she, she was a waitress, I was a bartender. It's like you had two mothers then in a way. She was 10 years old. Yes, she helped raise me when my mother was working so. outdoors. She took care of me. Right. So basically, I knew her very well, but she passed away recently. I'm sure that hurt, yeah. Well, tell me, how did you get into playing the piano? Was that something your mother wanted you to do or? My father was a musician and he loved music. And uh, he wanted me to play the piano and learn music and violin. And I had an aptitude for the piano. He used to drive me every week to a teacher couple hours away and I practiced and I got very good at it. I actually got a scholarship offer from Juilliard, if you ever heard of Juilliard School of Music. I was pretty good at concert. But yeah. did you go? Did you go to Juilliard? No, I chose instead to go to Fordham University. Okay. I wanted to become a lawyer. And how'd that go? I didn't, as Why? you can see. Why? Okay, I got into Fordham with a scholarship and at Fordham I saw how much work it took to become a lawyer, how much studying you had to do, reading and writing. I said, no, that's not for me. So I went into communications because I felt at that point television was going to become a major factor in the lives of America. So I liked the idea and I... You should talk about your grandfather. You learned from him. He... That's right. My grandfather was... He now this on your mother's side or your father's side? On my mother's side, my grandfather was played in Stalin's orchestra. My background is Polish-Russian. Okay. He played in Stalin's orchestra, and he was at home always playing, so I kind of was brought up in the music world. So anyway, I studied piano, and I got very good at and it. And he taught you piano from when you were three years old. That's but basically, I decided to go to Fordham. I wanted to go to school in New, in New York City, so they were both in New York, so I chose Fordham. I went there, and I changed from being a pre-law student to a communication arts student. My first job out of college was working for WMCA radio as a radio announcer. And it was in Fordham that I went, met my wife at the time. So that was a circumstance that I've always been grateful for. Now, um, that's that. First job out of school was WMCA radio and then I went into other things. And I met my wife who I married right after that. You've only been married once? Yes. Yes. I'm still on with the same wife, for which I'm very grateful. She was my home run with stars. So and we're now that? over 50 years on the road to forever together. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. What is it, 52 yeah. years now? 54 mm, about years? that. Mm -hmm. So tell me, so what got, you into, what got you to Japan first? You met your wife at Fordham. At Fordham. Now, what was she studying? Was she, in she was going to a, she had gone to Sacred Heart School here in Japan. And there was the God, sure of that. Sacred Heart uh, in Purchase, New York, called Manhattanville. So she went there for college. And it was a mixer between Fordham and Manhattan, both that and Ville. Both were uh, Catholic schools. So she came over and I met her one day. And the first day I saw her, I was thunderstruck. I saw her and I said, oh my God, she was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And that was it for me. I said, I want to be with this woman. And it worked out at that point. That's I won't right. give you the details of it, right. but basically from that point on, we dated forever and then married. And as I said, we're 50 years on the road to forever together. Oh, that's beautiful. And I hope this will continue still for some while. Now she's taking care of me because I'm having troubles yeah. from coming from a car accident I had when I was young. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what brought me to Japan? When people ask, like you just said, why did I come to Japan? There were three people. Okay. A woman, Stan Lee, and Spider-Man. The woman is the wife I've mentioned. Now, when I came to Japan a few times on trips, I liked what I saw here. What I saw was a country that was prospering, it was doing well, it was safe, it was clean, it was beautiful. I wanted part of it. But yet, I knew nothing about Asia. I couldn't speak Japanese, I knew nothing about Japan. So I thought, what am I gonna to do to live, thrive, and survive in this country? Started looking around, and one thing I saw was there was a tremendous proliferation of comic books, manga. Everywhere I went, there was manga. A bookstore, a subway, kiosk, a convenience store, you'd find Japanese comic books everywhere, and everybody was reading them. 
kids, men, women, adults in America was quite different. So the industry here was huge. And I said, wow, this industry is tremendous. But another thing I noticed was there were no American comics. So I looked around and I couldn't find any. Go to a bookstore, I'd say, do you have American comics? And they say, no, we don't carry them. So I'm trying to figure out why. And anyway, there was nothing there. So I start to myself, look at this huge industry. Maybe if I can get American comics into Japan, I can make a living. I went back to America and I made an appointment with Marvel Comics. I went to New York City and I met with the then guiding genius of Marvel, who was Stan Lee. Was that easy to do or was it complicated? I was pretty good at talking. Okay. I got on the phone and I said I want to talk to Stan Lee and gave him my pitch which I'd learned from WMCA radio, how to introduce yourself, how to work. I don't think that would happen in today's day and age. A total stranger out of the blue saying, I want to meet Stan Lee. That's what, that's it, what I'm it, thinking. It doesn't work in today. I don't so know. I went down to the office, I sat down with him and I said, Stan, your comics are everywhere. You're so popular. Everywhere you go, you can find Marvel comics. But the country that is the biggest comic book market in the world is Japan. And you're not out there. They don't even know you exist. Why? And Stan said, Gene, I don't know why. We've never had a call for comics there. So I said, Stan, give me a chance. I want to go to Japan. I'm not going to call it, charge you anything. I'll pay for my trip over. Let me do some research and then check on why you guys have never succeeded there. So he said, yes. Stan and I kind of hit it off together. And I took some lessons about comic books because I knew nothing about comics at the time. So I went to New York, learned how they're put together, how they're written, how they're printed, how they're marketed. And I went to Japan, made a meishi, a card for myself that said, Gene Palk, Marvel Comics representative Japan. Started meeting with all the publishers. And unfortunately, I couldn't make too many deals. Everybody wanted to talk to me, but nobody wanted to make a deal. Until finally, I made a hit with one publisher who was publishing something called the Japan Play, the Japanese Playboy. And Playboy agreed to do a run of Spider-Man. I made a deal for a three month run and they put it in there. But frankly speaking, it failed. Do you remember the year? What year are we talking about? That would about be now? late 70s. Late. So the Playboy Spider-Man thing failed. When mm -hmm. I say failed, they didn't renew the run. And I wasn't surprised. Nobody was buying Playboy to read comics. They were buying Playboy to look at the girls. I like to read the articles, right? <laughs> so basically, that failed. However, during that time, I was watching Japanese television, and I saw a lot of something called tokusatsu, which is Japanese live-action superheroes. In particular, I loved the program called Godenja, Five Rangers. And I saw that there was mass products everywhere. You could buy shirts, posters, toys, comic books, everything based on the TV show. So I said, maybe this is the way to get Marvel into Japan. If the comic books are not working, which I found out why later, maybe TV is the way to go. So I found out who was the producer of these shows, which was a company called Toei. I made the same deal like with Stan. I called up Toei and I got an appointment with the president of Toei. And I said, Toei, you guys make all these superheroes in Japan. You guys are so popular here, but you're nothing in America. And I said, I represent Marvel, who is the biggest superhero company in America, but they have nothing in Japan. Why don't we make a deal? Why don't I try to get Marvel to popularize your superheroes in America, and you do this for Marvel? The president of Toei agreed. And the first show we did was Spider-Man. Gee, you, you're just starting to remind me of something. That's the reason why Spider-Man in Japan had a robot. Okay. Because yes. of Toei. Yes. That was all you. Yes. Well, not all me. Not you, a, but that basically they had, they had the agreement that they'd only do it if they could add a robot to it. Two or three weeks after I met with the president of Toei, he called me up and said, we have an opening on Channel 12 for a year's show. I want to do Spider-Man. I said, okay, that sounds great to me, let's go for it. He said, one problem. The sponsor is a toy company called Bandai. And Bandai wants toys. As a sponsor, they need to sell something. And Spider-Man doesn't have that many openings. It's got Spider-Man, basically, but nothing else. And I say, he said, one of the other things is they want to do a robot, because robots are extremely popular. And the robots were wonderful die-cast toys that could shoot missiles, 
have lights and stuff and were great toys. But unfortunately, Spider-Man had nothing to do with robots. However, I sat there thinking, look, if the sponsor doesn't come in, I don't have a show. I don't have a show, I'm out of here. I go back to the States with my tail between my legs. Now that was a damn good reason for me to have a Spider-Man robot. So I said, okay, we need a robot, let's put a robot in. So I met with some of the creative people. We came up with ideas how to do this thing. We came up with some elements for toys. We had a car that flew, a flying car called GP7. A lot of people thought GP meant Grand Prix, but it actually stands for Gene Pelt because my show in radio was GP Stay Loose, I would sign off with. So it was a GP flying car. Now what would happen is we'd have people that Spider-Man could fight, and then when the opponent, the adversary, became so great, it was too much for Spider-Man, he needed a robot to help fight it. So the GP-7 would fly into a robot and, and kind of morph into this giant robot called Leopardum. Now a lot of people have asked me, why a flying car? And I'd say, why not? <laughs> Same reason they said, why is a robot called Leopardon? And I'd say, why not? And we did it. So we shot a pilot with the car and with the robot and everything else in it. Peter Parker became a Japanese character called Takuya, Yamashiro Takuya, who was a motorcycle racer. And the motorcycle became a toy. So now Bandai was happy. They had all the elements they needed to be the sponsor, and we had a TV show, so we shot one. I called New York and I said, we've shot a pilot. You guys want to see it before we go? And they said yes. So we set up a time where a bunch of executives from New York flew over to Japan. And we were sitting, I remember it now, in a toy screening room. The lights go out, the show came on, and there was everything that they had never seen stuff like this, a flying car and a robot and stuff. And I'm sitting there hope, saying to myself, myself, I hope these guys like it. If not, where do I go from here? I hope this is going to be good. Lights come on, nothing. Silence, dead silence. Nobody said a word, except for one guy who stood up applauding, and that was Stan Lee, who said, this is great. This is a living comic book. This is terrific. So then the executives looked at me and said, Gene, good idea, let's go with this. You got a deal. <laughs> you got a deal, let's go with this. So that was it, that was the start of Spider-Man. Oh, that's beautiful. So I have to thank Stan for that too. Yeah. Now, we did that run of a year and that did very, very well. It was extremely good ratings, the money was pouring in, we had licensed products, shirts, hats, everything you could think of. Toys, comic books, all coming from the TV show. Money was great. I was sending a check every month to New York and they were very happy. Ratings are good, money's good, what more do you want? So then that show ended and we got a chance to do another since that was so popular. And that idea of the robot in Spider-Man actually revolutionized tokusatsu in Japan that had been going on for a while. This was a new element for them. So we came up with a new concept based loosely on the Avengers. It was called Denji Man. The main difference being Actually, that Captain Battle, America, Battle Fever J was mm -hmm. another one. And Battle Fever J, the main difference was it wasn't Captain America as the leader, it was Captain Japan, because this was Japan. So we made that show and that was popular also and that had a robot as well. Now that was the start of something later in my life to come about called the Power Rangers, which you may have heard about. And I heard that actually you got the short end of the stick, but they no. won't say it, but basically a year after you'd already proposed I, it and set had, it out, someone I, else took credit for well, it. Well, what happened during this time when I'm doing this in Japan, Marvel had changed from being just a comic book company in New York to becoming a film studio. And they had bought a, per, a studio in L.A. And a lot of the guys, including Stan, moved to L.A. because they saw the future coming in te television. They wanted to get their characters on Saturday morning TV and syndicated stuff. So I used to go over and learned a lot about the business at that time. So while I was there, I had this idea that, you know, that you're doing this animation for Spider-Man and we're doing the business of TV in America for kids' superheroes. Now I had all of these programs that we had made in Japan, which when I looked at it, they were very exciting. The kids, even who didn't understand what was being said, loved the programs and I thought, you know, if we got this on in America, this will work. All we got to do 
is reshoot the parts that show the Japanese faces. Now in those shows that we were doing all of the expensive stuff, the fighting, the choreographed martial arts, the explosions, were all done with characters in costume. So you never saw their faces. So all we have to do is get American actors to play where the Japanese actors were playing. That's cheap, that's studio work. All the expensive stuff is already in the camera. All we need to do is make duplicate negatives. And from the duplicate negatives, we got two thirds of the budget made already. We cut that in with the live actors in America and we got a brand new show. And I made a pilot out of that. And I went to Stan Lee with that and I said, Stan, what do you think? And he says, I think this is great. Let me try to sell this. I went back to Japan because I was working on shows that we were doing there at that point and Stan was to sell this show and what happened was he was not the power at that time that he became later on in the world of television and movies and a woman named Margaret Lesh who was working for Marvel at the time quit Marvel, took my promo reel went out and sold it. She sold it to a company called Fox. They had something called Fox Kids and they sold something called the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers which became a very big hit. Unfortunately Stan was cut out, I was cut out. She hired a person by the name of Haim Saban to produce it and they work with Fox. I lost this chance so my biggest success actually became a financial failure because I was cut out of it. That hurt Haim Savan was your music guy. Haim Savan was, mm. was cutting music for Saturday morning shows at the time and he used to sit in, in these rooms and watch these shows and Margaret Lesh hired him and they got the job. So my biggest success as I say became my biggest financial failure. I was cut out of it and I said never again. So after Marvel I made my own company. Mm -hmm. During these years while I was doing the Marvel work I noticed that a lot of foreign non-Japanese music artists were coming to Japan and I saw the tremendous business they were doing. They were selling huge amount of tickets, they were selling uh, merch, t-shirts, merch, posters, programs, hats, everything you could imagine. There was huge money in this and I said look there's so much money in this I should get into this. I figured out what was going on and I found out that at the time all these foreign artists gave their merchandising rights to the promoter and the promoter did the uh, business giving them a few thousand dollars per show and that was it. Well their interest was in selling tickets and I realized this so I saw how the bands were getting short changed on the li little money they were making out of this huge business I saw. So I said you know here's an opening, this, there's a lot of business here, there's an opening here. A company, a, a group that was extremely popular at the time back in the 70s was Duran Duran. I don't know if you remember that name. They were extremely popular. 80s. Now they came in and did huge business in Japan. They were one of Japan's favorite foreign groups. So I met with Duran Duran and I said, look, you guys are doing great business out there selling tickets, but the amount of merch you sell, the amount of money you're making is nothing. I said, you're not maximizing what you could do. If you give me a chance, to do the merchandising. I'll do it. You'll make 10 times the amount of money you're making now. All you got to do is separate the merchandising from your show. So I remember the first problem that came about was we were working with a promoter by the name of Udo and Mr. Udo did not like the idea of losing the merch to me. However, I got friends with Simon Lebon, the head singer of Duran, who went to Mr. Udo and said, Mr. Udo, I want Jane to do the merchandising if you don't let them do that I don't appear on stage. Now that's the worst thing a promoter can hear. They've sold thousands of tickets and the singer doesn't want to get on stage. To them that's mortal sin. So he gave in, let me do it. Now I realized at that point I didn't want to make a friend, on, I wanted the promoters to be my friends and work with me. So therefore I figured out a way to cut them in on the action. I gave them a percentage of the gross and had them do some things in exchange and it worked out pretty well. They were making money, they didn't do any of the work, they didn't take any of the risk, I did that. And that business worked very well. The word got around and I started doing a lot of other bands. If I remember some of the early ones I did was Rolling Stones, you may have heard of them. Uh, heavy metal groups like Metallica, Iron Maiden, they all started coming to me and the money was going great. 
I was making huge money for the bands and for myself. So I continued that business. I made a company called Pelk Enterprises and we did um, the merch for these guys and my business, new business had started. I was a fan of pro wrestling. One of the things that I did as rehabilitation from and physical therapy from an accident I'd had when I was a kid was martial arts. So I was very interested in ring fighting, boxing, kickboxing, and wrestling. And pro wrestling was extremely popular in Japan at the time. It was being put on everywhere in Tokyo throughout Japan. And at that time, a group of wrestlers got tired of doing the kind of thing that you associate with pro wrestling, the theatrics, you know, the hitting each other with chairs and spinning and stuff. They wanted to shoot. Now this shooting was a kind of shooting that had nothing to do with guns. It had everything to do with real fighting. Mm -hmm. So they, a group started called the UWF International. Their champion was a guy by the name of Nobuhiko Takata. And they became enormously popular. And one of the guys from the UWFI that knew of me came to me and said, Gene, would you like to do our TV work? They knew that I'd work with Marvel and Toei. So I said, okay, this sounds good, sounds like fun to me. It sounded like something that I wanted to do and I thought was becoming very popular. So I said, yes. And I'd go to the shows and got the TV rights. Now at the time, they also asked me to be a booker. A booker in the business of fighting is somebody who contracts fighters to come and take part in, in the various fights that you have. So they started, they wanted to have some foreign fighters, so I got I booked fighters from the USA, Europe, Canada, Australia, and others and brought them over, basically because of my ability to communicate with, in English. So we brought these people over and the UWFI became enormously popular in Japan. They sold out the Tokyo Dome in hours once, and they had the show which had a basic lineup of Japanese fighters and foreigners, which was kind of new at the time. And they were doing a kind of wrestling that's not what you associate with Greco-Roman or putting a guy's shoulders Some down thing. on the mat for a three count. It was called submission wrestling. Mm -hmm. Now this is when you take a, some part of a guy, twist it, and until he has to give out. up and he has right. to tip out tip or, he, or not get knocked out. Right. From a chokehold he might pass out. So that wrestling was kind of new, submission wrestling. Came from Sambo and other kind of sports, but it was new to wrestling at the time and they became enormously popular and I watched this stuff and I said you know we don't have anything like this in the West I bet you if we took this to America and Europe this would be extremely popular so I had the raw footage that I had shot for TV raw footage meaning you had shots of the guys fighting in the ring no announcing no talking you had the sound of what was going on in the ring you had the crowd noise I took that raw footage made a deal with a guy in England that was a producer and distributor. Now, uh, I went to them with my raw footage and with my idea. I said, look, this is something new. I think it could work for you guys. How about cutting this into a, a show for you guys to distribute? And we called it Sy Through Syndication Worldwide. And he agreed. He liked the idea. So at this point, I brought in my son, Ted, who was very knowledgeable about what was going on. He had gone to a gym similar to this and worked out, so he knew the sport, he knew a lot of the fighters, and he knew what was going on, and he could speak English and Japanese, so I said, look it, I'll have Ted come over into England. He'll help you cut the shows, because everything, the instructions, everything that came was in Japanese. I said, he'll help you edit the shows, and he can do the color announcing. We hired a, a British professional announcer to do the straight, announcing and Ted did the color. The show became enormously popular. We called it Bushido, the way of the warrior. It became popular throughout Europe and in fact in, in England it even outdrew football, which mm. was amazing. It became so popular in Israel that a promoter brought our group out to fight in Tel Aviv. Mm. They like fighting there so this was a natural for them. So we did that. Then I, at the same time, took the same raw footage and went to America and made a show called Shoot Wrestling, It's Real. And that became a hit on pay-per-view. Mm. Now, what happened then, that stuff was doing well. Bushido was getting great ratings. 
the pay-per-view did well, got to know, know a lot of people in the business, but what happened then, the problem was that the UWFI folded in Japan. They had financial problems of their own. What year was this? No, this was probably... Basically, the, the most influential time was from uh, May of 91 till 93. So All right, so I brought my son over, Ted, to help edit the shows because he could read and speak Japanese and he knew the, uh, the uh, fighters and he knew the style. And so I left him in England. He spent two or three months there. Oh, it was more than that, wasn't it? Actually, it, it ended up being uh, like three years, but it was kind of weird because I, I used to have to go once every three months and I'd only work like two or three days. So it's, it felt like I was flying more than I was so working what you over do? there. What was your, what was your job? Well, you when there? I first went over there, they wanted to edit the show and they kind of had a pretty good idea of editing. It was very different from the American style because like when you're making a fighting program or any kind of sports program in the States, it's in your face, instant replays, music, explosions. British style is very different. It was a little bit more, I don't know, looking so at a do. gardening show or a cooking okay. show. You know, okay. they had their style. But it was very good and professional for what it was. Actually, uh, my producer was a guy who, who was on Benny Hill's team. He used to make all those things back in Thames. So, and then uh, I, I, would tell him, I would tell him because I, I had done a little bit of TV work and editing too, so I'd, I'd help the show. But basically, they needed color because nobody knew this because... You know, if you're talking about boxing or kickboxing or, say, Greco-Roman or football, like Olympic-style wrestling, you can find people who can do color. But this was... Actually, I shouldn't say it was new. This sport was so old that it was new. Nobody remembered it. Now, when you're saying color, what do you mean? What, what's term Com Color saying? commentary. So, so like, like, for what? the play-by-play, -play, the, okay. the straight announcer, we had a five-time world karate champion. Right. And he, he was doing the play-by-play, -play, and I was doing the... Color commentary. No, what's the color right. commentary? Explain to me. Okay, what's so the, the so the the play by play guy is basically if you look at a lot of sporting things, you'll have two guys. One guy is just going to call it. They're going to say, "Wow, what a great kick! Wow, what a great punch!" He knows what, what was that? Right. Yeah, he's just going to call exactly what you can see what, what with he your just eyes. Did. Right. Okay. But he can explain I'm, it to you. Say that was the mm. the the figure four. Or this and that. He knows yeah, he'll, he, he'll say it's like this is a double wrist lock or this is gotcha, a Boston okay. Crab or this is like a, this is like a, a rear naked choke hold or something. Okay, gotcha. He'll say that, but I'll explain why he applied that or why he's doing oh, that's it. that's the color too. So the play-by-play the, the play -play guy just says what you can see by eye. The color guy is the guy who explains what you cannot see. Right, and why he's screen. turning red and stuff. And yeah, and <laughs> well, why, why, why is he just going for the low kicks? And why is the other guy trying to get on the floor when the other guy's trying to... Why, why, why? That's right, basically exactly. the color has to explain what's going on the I whole hear, time. So anyway, they needed a color. And uh, I was about the only one who lived and knew because it was like an old style of wrestling, actually professional wrestling. This is gonna get too long, so I'm not gonna get into it too much, but it originally was known as a sport called catch as catch can, okay. which uh, a lot of people don't realize that's actually older than amateur wrestling. Actually, amateur sports don't have a long history. People, I be, people get shocked when I say that professional wrestling has been around longer for, than a, amateur wrestling. Everybody gets blown away, but that's true for anything because a hundred years ago, people didn't do sports as a hobby or for fitness. People had to survive. People had to eat like 100, 150 years ago. Nobody put on like their Nike shoes and just ran around for the sake of running. <laughs> if you true. were running, it was either somebody was trying to kill you or right. <laughs> you were trying to do something that actually was feeding your family. There's no such thing. So people don't realize it, but amateur sports really doesn't have a long history if you want to go back to it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this catch as catch can came all along, it turned into amateur wrestling, professional wrestling and things, and actually uh, we are talking about like the, earlier the Inoki and uh, Ali, fight. Ali fight. Actually from that point it was starting at the New Japan Dojo, they were starting to bring other people because they wanted to add on to this catch as catch can style, which became like entertainment wrestling, shoot wrestling. They actually brought people from Brazil who were adept in Luta Livre and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was already happening there. So, and actually, my teacher, who was the original Tiger Mask, you can look that up. Right. Him with Inoki, they wanted to start something. And Inoki was, it was weird because in the 1970s, um, he said that I don't know when, I don't know where, I don't know how, but sometime it might be five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, mixed martial arts is going to be created modern day. It's going to happen. 
so we have to be prepared for that. So they started, and my teacher, actually in the 80s, he was the one who came up with the concept of the octagon and like the open finger gloves, and it was a, an association sport called shooting, which now people call shooto. Okay. Shoot which was the original form of MMA. That was back in the 80s. I mean, the UFC didn't even start until 1993. That's that was one thing. When you're saying shooting, that's not when the guy comes at the guy, lower part? That's not, it's not a move? No. Shooting means... Sh yeah. Shoot. You're shoot. fighting for real. Shoot just means for real. for real. Basically. And a work is the opposite. The work just means that you know who the winner is. Choreographed. Okay, that's not, when guys not are jumping off the really ropes. Not really choreographed, but you know it's right. predetermined. You know what they're going to do. Predetermined. And the Finish outcome is predetermined as a work. But in, in, in grappling sports, you say that when it's predetermined, you call it a work. In striking sports like boxing or kickboxing, it's called a fix, like the fix is Okay, there. of course, right. And every sport has their name. Yeah, like yeah, in yeah. tennis, it might be banking or something. Okay, right. But in, in sumo, it might be yaucho or chushagahaidu. Yes. And like gachinko means real. So every sport has their name for real and, and the one that's predetermined. Right, predetermined. So every sport in wrestling, it just happens to be called a shoot and a work. Uh, wow, that clears that up. So yeah. that's why he did, my teacher decided to call it shooting because even though it was kind of sort of a new sport because he added sambo, he added judo, he added jujitsu, he added muay thai and a lot of sports onto this wrestling base to create this mixed martial, martial arts thing. And well, since it was all real, he just mm -hmm. called it shooting and then they eventually ended up called shoot. For a brief period they called it pancras because apparently a lot of the old fighters called the submission wrestling with striking pancras but it's okay. not to be confused with the pancras that everybody knows today apparently that uh, name was around for a very long time mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. mixed martial arts was too uh, is there anything else you saw you wanted to go through all right well basically that covers what we did with the uwfi okay. which yeah. as i think i mentioned earlier to you was the forerunner yeah. of the ufc which has basically replaced boxing in america as a spectator sport you go to Atlantic City, Las Vegas, it's UFC now. Boxing is pretty much gone. It seems to have died out with a guy by the name of Mike Tyson. Right? Back in the TV world now, we had started Marvel Productions and I had brought over the idea of what I told you earlier about Power Rangers. But another thing that was going on was Marvel who wanted to start a new studio. And I made a lot of trips out there and I started thinking about one thing and American animation in my mind had gone downhill from the great animations the classics of Walt Disney like Fantasia and Bambi and the Warner Brothers great cartoons like Tom and Jerry Roadrunner wonderful cartoons with tremendous action and beautiful drawings had gone down to what was called limited animation run by companies called Hanna-Barbera and Ruby Spears. They made shows like Scooby-Doo and the Flintstones with very limited action. The backgrounds, if you look closely, were often repeated. The motion was very limited. You'd see a character stand looking at the camera going, and then you'd marry the words to the mouth movements. But other animation was dropped because animation movement means money. You had to draw, it's what I call the pickle industry. You had to draw a uh, cell for every motion. And that required a lot of people and a lot of time. So Hanna-Barbera and Ruby Spears and other American companies started sending the work overseas where it was cheaper, mainly Korea. And they had this very, what I thought was limited animation. A great animator by the name of Chuck Jones one call, once called it animated radio. It was kind of awful, I felt. Now I had watched during this time Japanese animation and I saw some terrific stuff. The backgrounds were beautiful. Every shot was a masterpiece. They were beautifully drawn. And I said, you know, if we could put Japanese animation together with our concepts in America, we could come up with something new and, and I think this will really work in America. So I went back to Marvel Productions in LA and I brought some reels of Japanese animation. I said, look, you guys have a chance to do this. I'm in Japan. I can help you on this. We marry your ideas. You come up with the show. You sell the uh, show. You make the characters. You make the storyboards and everything else that's required. Send it to Japan and I'll go and produce it there. 
and you'll have great animation such as we haven't seen since the days of Disney. And they agreed. Luckily, I was able to talk them into that. So I went to Toei's animation studio called Toei Doga. And with the budget that America had for a half hour, it was a great idea for the Japanese because it was so much more money than they could make working in Japan. So I said, look, we'll send you these shows, you animate them, we'll pay you this huge amount of money. That kind of regenerated a lot of animation in Japan because they had the money to hire better artists, more people, and they started producing our shows. And I remember the first one we did was a cartoon for a commercial called G.I. Joe, the All-American Hero. When it first appeared on American TV, the TV just exploded in color. Hadn't seen anything like this for a while. The TV set itself just looked like color had somebody had adjusted it and it changed. And it made a big hit. And from that, Marvel Productions became very popular. It started selling a lot of shows. And I would produce them in Japan with Toei Doga. We're doing shows like G.I. Joe, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Transformers, Muppet Babies, Toy My Little Pony. That stuff made Marvel Productions extremely popular and kind of revitalized the industry for a while. I remember the first one you did was Pink Panther because Marvel had just bought out DePatty Freeling Studios. Yeah, the studio they bought was DePatty Freeling that made Pink Panther, which is an extremely difficult cartoon to animate. And I, we did it and it looked good. They said, well, if they can do Pink Panther, they can do anything. Panther. Pink Panther is hard to do if you look at the originals. Every animated character you see on TV now has a black line around it. Pink Panther has only pink lines. If you look at the old ones, you'll see all the uh, emotions, very difficult to do so. And he has tremendously different, difficult expressions, which part of the charm of Pink Panther are the expressions of the characters. So we brought a director over from Japan, from America to Japan, and I would babysit the American directors here, get a translator for them and go to the studio and work out the problems. We created that and we started making all of this stuff. One of the problems was G.I. Joe, the all-American hero, being made in Japan was not a great thing. So we cut out the Japanese names and put in just the names of the Americans, the guys who did the storyboard and the models and the speaking. And money was okay for Toei, so that's what counted there. So that kind of got started, and, and then as you know, there was some films got to be enormously popular in America. You'll probably remember the Transformers, which you'll see my name on as a producer. So that was another thing that was doing very well for a while. But then another problem came up. The Japanese yen gained in power. The American dollar was falling. For a long time, the dollar had been pegged to the gold standard. Japanese animation was, of course, paid in, in Japanese yen, which was about 360 to 300 yen or so to a dollar. So a dollar moved into Japanese currency, made a lot of money. But then Endaka, with the fall of the value of the dollar, could no longer buy it. The dollar was going down so far that that had to stop. So that came to a halt. And then also computers started coming into animation which replaced the need for all the human beings that had to draw the stuff. So that business fell down. Now during that animation stage where I was with Marvel Productions and Toei Doga, I had noticed another thing. A lot of these performers that I mentioned earlier from Europe and America were coming to Japan making extraordinary money. And I watched all this stuff going on and I said, hey, all that money there, I should be part of that. So the first group, as I mentioned, was Duran Duran that I work with. And I said, you know, you guys are making all this animation, all this music and all this merchandising, but you're getting very little money. If you let me do it, you'll make a hell of a lot more. So I said, all you got to do is take your merchandising rights away from your performing rights. Give them to me and I'll do the merchandising for you. And I could work closely with your artists. And the artists can use the merchandising to get part of their performer to the people. The fans will love being in touch with your people. If, you're, if you guys work on the programs and the drawings and stuff and do what you love, the fans will associate with that and they'll want the product more. So I talked to Duran Duran, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. Simon Le Bon bought into me. He was the lead singer and he told Mr. Udo, who was the promoter, that if Gene doesn't do it, I don't appear. Mm -hmm. And so that made the deal. 
I started did, being friends with the promoters. Did they use any kind time. of animation and stuff with these groups? Did you have that connected together in any no, way? No, no, it was two totally no, separate. It was two different it was totally separate. It was okay. After you did all of this, did you? Where did you end up after COVID? Or did COVID really put all a right. big dent? In so here I'm rolling along with the merchandising business. I'm right. doing virtually everybody that you ever heard of that came to Japan. We're right. using Gene Pelk. Right. I'm talking about John Bon Jovi, Madonna, Rolling Stones, Rolling Stones. Stones. Uh, Iron Maiden, Taylor Swift. Well, who who didn't we do? Everybody, the, uh, basically, every, almost, basically everybody. Almost yeah. everybody who came to Japan went through me because the money was mm. doing so well. Right. Then another problem came up. This one I couldn't beat. That was COVID. The government stopped issuing visas to people from abroad, and yeah. the bands who were touring stopped touring. So nobody was coming here, and Japanese bands did not give away their merchandising rights like American bands and European bands did. So you had so no chance of getting, breaking that market? There was nothing to break. There was nobody coming over there. Well, and, and the venues were also limited. This the Japanese, didn't let a the lot of Japanese people bands in. bands weren't playing either. They Everybody couldn't. was on lockdown. Nothing was happening. That's right. The Probably. venues limited the number of people coming in. So that killed the, the merchandising business. Completely. So that ended. So what did you do in lieu of that? I mean, of course the subsidies didn't really help. They just kind of like put in a band. Well, I had on made it. quite a bit of money on in merchandising, and I saved it. Yes, that's good. Which I've had been used in since then. So yeah, the COVID kind of killed that business. Well, so, even yes. after the earthquake for six months, nobody wanted to come over here. The foreign talents. That's true. Because mm -hmm. you know why? So that was the first. That was the first shock. But then. Yeah, they looked at TV. They saw that flooding, and then they thought that that was the entire country because they only saw that one little clip, and they said. Well, no, they saw that one little clip for three months, every yeah. second. Single, so nobody's so, yeah. there saying, why the hell would we want to go to Japan That's right. now? Exactly. And exactly. so for six months, we were dead. So what would you do, six months, would you do during that back. time, too? Well, during that time, we have a, I have a medical problem. I had a bad leg from being a kid in high school. I decided to get a hip replacement, mm, that's and it went bad. You had it done here in Japan? Here in Japan, yes. I don't want to get into the details okay, well, of it, but it didn't go well. It went very badly. Right. I wound up being almost a year in bed. You're catching me on the end portion of that year. I'm now in rehab, trying to walk and move again like I used to. Which I don't think would? I'll ever be afraid of stair, but right. at least I'll be able to walk around. I'll chase you. Okay, that'd be good. <laughs> now, <laughs> so anyway, so, so that that was the first thing that right. was right after the. The earthquake that happened and all the nuclear fallout. Mainly it was COVID that stopped So that. COVID stopped everything. Mm. It stopped everything in that business. So I did get back into it because one of the things is everybody in the world knew of Gene Pelk in Japan. And they said, if you want to do merch, you got to use this guy. So they started calling me. And as you know, recently Japan opened up. They had all the summer festivals, Fuji Rock, Download Festival, Summer Sonic. How did it go? It did all right. I got involved in that in a different way. I wasn't actually working at the uh, the venues anymore. I became kind of an agent consultant. I put the deals together for bands in the States and Europe to come here. And I put a, 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 a lot Lady of the Gaga group, well after right. the festivals, I did uh -huh. Billie Eilish, together with a Japanese group of merchandisers, and I was there in between communication point to negotiate the deals and talk about everything, how it'd mm -hmm. be done. So we did Billie Eilish just recently, and Lady Gaga finished about two, three weeks ago, if you remember. They did very, very well. I'm gonna do uh, Justin Bieber if he does come over. He's supposed so, to come over. He sold a lot of tickets, but he's very sick. Right. He may so, not come. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. You yes. see it getting brighter. That's good. And I'm looking at some new things that I'm doing. And maybe through your podcast here, Lance, maybe we can come up with something. Let's do it. Uh, I've written a book about Japan that I think has legs as a TV or a movie. Has it been published yet? No, I'm looking for a publisher okay. or a literary but you know, agent. But, but you can actually do it yourself, you know. However, with a good, without a good agent, it's there's so much yet. stuff out there That's now. True. That's true that it's very difficult. So I'm, I'm a realist. I've been in the commercial okay. end of stuff. Just writing a, a book or making a film is called, to me, Vanity Publishing. It's a book that winds up on your mantelpiece and nowhere else. So I'm looking for an agent or a publisher who wants to work with me. 
I think the book is very good. I think it's perfect for somebody like a Netflix or somebody that's interested in doing a movie. And I do have quite a background of coming up with things that became fairly popular, as we've talked about. So uh, I've also got a new concept for a cartoon animation project that I want to get out there. So I'm looking for the right contacts, the right sponsors, the right to agents do the animation? to work with me on popularizing these things. Oh, but not to make the animation itself. Maybe even that too. Even I want to talk too. to somebody from the start to the finish. I have been in these things from initiation to the finale. So I'm looking for a contact who might believe in working with me and thinking that maybe lightning, lightning will strike again. Okay. Maybe we can work together. That's for sure. Lance, you've been here long enough to know that Japan as one of the first world countries has the smallest percentage of Christians of any country in the world. I've written a story about why. Wow. A lot of people don't know the story. Not even Japanese are aware of why this happened. Mm -hmm. There was a time in Japan, by the way, when Christianity was strong. It was called the Christian century. But it died out. And I figured out the reason for this and I wrote the story. Mm -hmm. and I think it would make a great film and a great book. So I'm looking for the right people. If anybody wants to talk to me, I'm here. Okay. I've got another concept because I'm worried about what's going on in Japan. I'm living here. I've got family here. I want to see Japan continue to prosper and do well. But I'm very scared by what I see happening in the Pacific. What's going on between America and China bothers me awfully. Mm -hmm. What I see in Taiwan scares me. I saw Hong Kong. I'm watching Taiwan. What if Japan is next? So I've come up with a concept to address that, which I'd like to talk to somebody, but I haven't copyrighted the idea, so until I until you get that, get that right. set, I want to yeah. wait. You're not going to go through the Power Rangers too. That's for I sure. don't want that to happen again. That's not, that won't happen That again. hurt. Or another that's UFC. Or, another <laughs> or UFC. UFC ball. Right, right. Yeah. So, I can see what your future is going to be. It's going to be very bright, because I'm going to make sure I help you as much as I can. Okay, I look forward to it. And I want to thank you so much for this time, Jane. All right, well, let's see. Ted. Thank you. Fantastic. Mm. I want to tell all of you watching this podcast right now, make sure you press like and subscribe. And remember, it's all unknown, so continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed.